and idealism and practicality. Fitching them together is really what makes it all possible. I think that's drawing, drawing us here today. The idealism is essential, like plowing the ground, and the practicality makes it all possible. The time of passivity, if it ever was proper, is no longer here. With global warming, with our crises of healthcare, education, housing, lack of good green jobs, lack of transportation. No longer can we say to ourselves implicitly or otherwise, this is happening to us. We have to, as an imperative, and you know, people say politics is the art of the possible. I think, like so much in life, it becomes the art of the imperative. No longer can we ask ourselves or tell ourselves, this is or what is happening to us. We've got to, for the sake of our loved ones and people that we will never meet, say, we're going to make this happen. We're going to reverse global warming. We're going to provide health care and education and housing to those we love and those we never met. We've all had these moments that are powerful for us to stay with us, and I'd like to share with you one that happened for me almost nine years ago on a, a gray morning in a plane circling Baghdad. It was December 2002, and with my new friend, who I'd met just days earlier, we're sitting near the front of the plane. We've flown from SFO to two other stops and then over the Iraqi capital. And my friend who is famous, but what's important is not his fame, but his humanity, Sean Penn. He turned to me and he said, when I've begun to wonder why we're making this journey, I see the child in front of us in the next seat. And there was a little girl sitting just in front of us said, when I see that little girl, I remember what this is all about. And I think every day that as we look around our own communities, that in some way often happens with us. You know, bumper sticker, bumper sticker politics has a bad, a bad reputation, that sounds quick, right? But occasionally you see a bumper sticker and it stays with you. And one has stayed with me and said, I love my country, but we've got to start seeing other people. <laughs> and I thought that has to do with international affairs, it has to do with people across the country, across the city, across the street maybe. How difficult to see another person truly, appreciate their beauty, their strengths, their vulnerabilities. The artist George O'Keefe said, do we ever really see a flower? We might ask ourselves, how often are we able to really see another human being and respond with empathy and with constructive connection and activity. That's something that Sean and I were trying to do as what turned out to be three months before the beginning of the invasion of Iraq. We went to that country to try to develop alternatives to massive violence and killing. Well, that effort was not successful. And we have reaped the whirlwind in Iraq and in our own country, including certainly Sonoma County. And that's a focus I want to share with you here this morning. If you look it up with the National Priorities Project, which has crunched the numbers, people living in Sonoma County in the last 10 years have sent to the IRS money that has then gone to pay for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, more than $2 billion, and that's what it be. And then you take out the back of the envelope and you can do it any way you want. Do all those zeros and Two at the left hand side, two billion. And uh, you know, if I said back the envelope, uh, I'm pre digital when I was growing up. And you do the math, you think, oh, it costs $8,000 to educate a child for a year in public school. Oh, it costs this many thousands of dollars for health care. This much to create a good green job in Santa Rosa or Cloverdale or Katata. And the magnitude of the cost begins to sink in. As Martin Luther King Jr. said in 1967, a nation that year after year continues to spend more on programs of military defense than in social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And when I thought of the theme of TED and what we're engaged in, part of it, as with our lives, has to do with the use of technology. 
technology all around us in our lifetimes exploding with tremendous, impressive force for, for good and sometimes not, it seems, for good. And I think of something that Dr. King said way back in the mid-1960s. He remarked upon what he called the phenomenon of guided missiles and misguided men. That technology does not assure us of anything, least of all, what only human beings can determine. There is not a digital widget or gadget or gadget in existence or ever future in existence that can do for us what only human beings can determine for ourselves. What we love, what we cherish, what we care about, what our priorities are. And so it comes back again to our own communities. Again, when you fractionate out those $2 billion, what do we want to do? Well, we have some tremendous models when it comes to reversing global warming, moving climate change in the correct direction, not way up to already 390 parts per million carbon dioxide, just in the last few years, moving up several, several parts. We know that Sonoma County is giving the country the model of the energy independence program of this county, encouraging through the process of use of people's property taxes uh, to be able to finance rooftop solar, conservation, retrofitting, insulation. And then we add to that the precept that the cheapest and the most ecologically sound, the cleanest green kilowatt, is the one we never use. This is a woefully, it's the purloined letter, it's hidden in plain sight, they're woefully ignored so often. Precept that can hold a key, not the only key, but a key to the kind of green sustainability that we want for our neighborhoods, our city, our county, our state, and truly, necessarily, the world. And that is that conservation may not be a big hit on Wall Street, but it's essential on Main Street. It's essential for our own communities. The tremendous potential, and I got to tell you, 40 years ago, as a well, a pretty young person, um, I was reading Amory Robbins, the great theorist. Even back in the late 1970s, the potential of conservation is just enormous. To me, this is one of the great. It's more exciting than sending somebody to the moon. No matter how fast the technology is, how impressive. The capacity to conserve with reverence for the future generations and for the planet, that is a realm that we're just beginning to get our toes into, into that particular water. And yet, the compelling necessity is there. When I think of the innovations in healthcare, I was just at the grand opening of the Petaluma Health Center a couple weeks ago. A new dental clinic, how exciting that is for low-income people regardless of their station in life, to come and to get dental care. There are 10% of the people in the North Bay, kids in school, have never seen a dentist. That's a new frontier to open up. So when we talk about achievement, sure, it's great to have the digital this, and new that, and big edifices, and so forth. But those are the achievements, I think, that we can be the most proud of, just as those who came before us they gave us so much. They gave us environmental protection laws. They gave us Social Security and Medicare and civil rights and women's rights and gay rights and all the ways that we may now take for granted. I can go into a restaurant now and I don't have to deal with cigarette smoke. What a tremendous breakthrough for public health. And yet, two, three decades ago, massively controversial. Huge battles needed to be fought. We're encouraged to measure our achievements by the dollars, the investment, the profits. And sure, business engines are part of that. But those engines, if they're carrying us over a cliff, whether through global warming or the increasing gap between rich and poor, tens and tens of millions of people with virtually no access to quality health care at all in our own country, the richest country in the world, all those great achievements will count for little. And again, technology is a good crucible with which to weigh our, and fire up our priorities. A few years ago, I working on a book, I went to the Los Alamos Weapons Laboratory in New Mexico, and you know, historically, the place where the atomic bomb was developed, still where nuclear weapons are being designed, and 
I looked in the phone book. I found it listed, by the way, under the University of California, which has always been in management of the nuclear weapons labs of the country. And it was taken around to um, various locations at Los Alamos. And the guy, the PR guy, was very proud. He said, in 1943, when the great heroes of the Manhattan Project, like J. Robert Oppenheimer, were here, the calculations were being done with a slide roll. And um, you know, sometimes I have to sort of remember them. I'm getting on in years. So uh, you know I, I just I, I like to quote Bill Rogers, who said it's not what people know. Uh, it's not he said, Bill Rogers said it's not what people don't know that bothers me, it's what they know that just ain't so. <laughs> and I tell that story on campuses and I realized, you know, I better explain to Will Rogers because I said it's he was like John Stewart without a TV show. So, <laughs> uh, so what is a slide roll? You know, it's like that song, what, uh, Daddy, What's a Train? Well, hopefully that will never come to pass, that we can bring our transit and train system back. But in this instance, if we look at what happened at Los Alamos then and now, the pride, yes, people here did the calculations for the atomic bomb with the slide roll. And by the way, slide roll was a way that you could do pretty complicated math. <laughs> with and it was sort of a piece of wood that slid through another thing. Um, and now, the, uh, the guide said, and now, from that time in 1943 with the slide roll, now, we have one room with one computer that does 10 trillion calculations per second. Is that progress? Well, it is progress, and yet, what use is that technological brilliance being put? Is it to feed the hungry, provide health care for those who lack? Is it reversing global warming? Is it providing jobs that are good, green, sustainable jobs? In a country that now, according to the New York Times, when you go beyond the 9.1 official rate of unemployment, certainly we're afflicted with that in this county. And you add in the underemployed and those who have given up looking for work, 16% unemployment, just on paper, massive desolation of people's morale, of their families, of their sense of the future. And when we look at that, and we can ask ourselves, you know, what is, what is our set of priorities here? And what do those 10 trillion calculations per second do to help us solve those problems. Well, they could be a tool. They could be helpful. But it all depends again on what our priorities are. Oh, one of the precepts that I take very seriously is something that George Orwell wrote in his book, 1984. He said, those who control the past control the future. Those who control the present control the past. And he was talking about ways in which history can be ignored, can be whitewashed, can be distorted, and how that is sort of the lenses that are ground through which we then see our present and our future. We try to grasp, we want to understand where we are now, how we got here, and that often informs or misinforms our sense of what our future is. And so when I go back to the visions of Martin Luther King Jr., it's with an effort to understand how that leader who not only led, but manifested and epitomized a groundswell of conscience into action, what he was really trying to convey, particularly in his last years. He talked about what he called the madness of militarism. He was not given to hyperbole, he didn't choose his words flippantly. But he understood that in 1967, as I think we can today, the toll that reliance on military force can take on society and on our world. And it has again to do with those $2 billion in our own community that were taken from us. Could we not bring them back? Well, what if we could? What a tremendous difference it could make in our own society. I work and have for 13 years now at the Institute for Public Accuracy, which is uh, a public policy research organization, and I edit news releases in the process. And one time a few years ago, already a few years, I got a draft of a news release, and it said that 300,000 men and women 
U.S. veterans have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan with traumatic brain injury. And being ticklish, I called up our Washington editor. I said, oh, that, there's a typo in here. I must have an extra zero. Was I wrong? That was a correct estimate, 300,000. They come back to a society that still can't guarantee the basic health care of human rights. They still can't guarantee a job for those who want a job, who want to work. That is a pledge that is left unfulfilled to serve the young people of our country with the kind of future, the kind of institutions, the kind of personal and social commitment that all Americans have a right to. Um, so let me just close by saying that I think the spirit of our gathering this morning, as I've sensed it, really is about the sense of idealism and practicality. And as I've traveled around uh, the North Bay and beyond now, uh, in my new role, and not accustomed to it, of running for Congress, I've tried to listen a lot more than talk. Um, and it's clear to me that people have idealism and also anguish right now. Anguish that is environmental, that is economic, that is social. A sense of turmoil, a sense of threat and instability, but also a sense of possibility. And that really, I think, is our future. The idealism is the plowing of the ground. The practicality is not only the tilling of the soil, but planting and nurturing of the seeds, listening, talking, and organizing. We're only here today because some hardworking people for months and months organized to make it possible. We can do that for the future so that today is the start of the kind of world that we want to help to create. Thank you very much.